and then you graduate and you think, well, I bet life must be this like clear road towards the end goal. And it's really not. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for being here. I'm hydrating because it's very warm. Today I wanted to do a little Q&A video with a little bit of like just life updates. Just talking about life. <laughs> it's almost been a year since I graduated. I feel like we just need to make a little video talking about the lore of this channel, what I'm doing with my life. And of course we'll talk about books too. I've organized the questions in little categories and I thought let's just immediately hop in with first some questions about books. This question asks out of all of the questionable book talk books that you've read which one was your favorite? This kind of depends on what you mean with questionable TikTok books because some of my favorite books are technically TikTok books as in I found out about them on TikTok like these Violent Delights and Bunny but I wouldn't call them questionable TikTok books. You know those were very serious recommendations I knew that I was probably gonna like them but if you're talking about TikTok books that kind of made me think mm, I don't know if that's my thing but I'm just gonna read it just to see what it's about I think my favorites The Serpent and the Wings of Night by Carissa Broadbent which was like a romance fantasy that was very much recommended for people who really liked Akatar and Sergio Maas they were like vampires so I was like this is gonna be very hit or miss for me, but it was a hit and I really like that book. If you like fast-paced tournament stories with well-developed romance and a well-developed fantasy, Serpent and the Wings of Night by Chris Robbins. What does your ideal bookstore look and feel like? I love this question and immediately I'm thinking of a little, it wasn't the, technically wasn't a bookstore, but it was a cat cafe in Hanoi city in Vietnam. It was a cat cafe so you could pet the cats, get your cute little cafes and like your beautiful macchiatos with all these cute little flavors but then you could also read books there and that would be my ideal bookstore. If it's like a cafe and there's cats and then there's this little side where you can just pick out books to read while you're there and then I guess they would all have to be secondhand books because you can also buy them if you want to and just kind of browse and people can also bring their books there and then you can read the books when you're sitting there and then buy one if you really like it. I think that would be a great concept. If everything else fails in life, I would like to start a cute little bookstore with a cafe attached to it. The next question, okay. The question is, are you going to read Crime and Punishment someday? So I think I need to explain a little bit of the Bookleo channel lore for my main channel. I've been trying to read Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky for years. It's really bad. And every time I start reading it again, I never get very far. So it's become kind of a running joke that I have to read Crime and Punishment and I still haven't finished it. But I actually have an update on this. I have an update. So it turns out, I was talking to a friend and it turns out that the edition that I was reading, which was a Dutch translation, because you know, the original language is Russian. So I thought might as well read the Dutch translation instead of the English translation. Apparently the translation that I had was kind of hard to get through because she also couldn't get through that translation it's a slightly older translation but she had a newer translation and that made it readable for her and she very kindly provided that book for me i lent it from her so now wait, let me just show you so this is the old translation that you've seen me reading that i just could not get through um, and this is a more modern, newer translation that I lent from this friend. And I'm gonna try to continue reading Crime and Punishment by reading the better, more readable translation. And hopefully that will like fix a lot of things. Cause it really did show me that, you know, like the translation you get can have a big impact um, on how much you actually enjoy reading the book. So let's see how that goes. Let's see how that goes. Maybe I will find the book a lot more readable now that I have a different edition. Do you think you will continue to love fantasy as you get older? Definitely, definitely. I really don't agree with this idea that fantasy is something for young people or even just for kids. I think there's no 
age limit to liking fantasy. I know myself, I know I will always love magical fantasy lands. I will always love escaping into a kind of fairy world. Uh, so I think I will always love fantasy. I always want to daydream. I always want to you just imagine the impossible. Do you have a book club or are you thinking of creating one? I do have a book club. It's on my Patreon. My Patreon is called The Hidden Library and we have our little book club where we read a book every month. And for this month, we are reading um, The Left Hand of Darkness for Ursula K. Le Guin. So if you wanna join the book club, you can support me on Patreon. It's super fun. And then this question, okay, it's technically not book related, but I just put it here because I felt like it fit the vibe. Just kind of other media and that is your favorite Ghibli movie. I'm gonna be super basic and my favorite Ghibli movie is Howl of Moving Castle. It's the basic answer. It's just the cozy feeling, the little speckle of romance in there, the magic system. I just like love this like moving castle. I just love it when buildings have a bit of a bit of personality and just the little German fantasy vibes of it all. It's great. It's great. And Howl is fantastic. I am not wearing my Howl earrings today. I'm wearing my um, no face earrings today. But Howl is just, I love him. And then I also got a lot of questions about other hobbies that I have or like if I liked a game. And to that I say, yes, I would. I think my main hobby aside from reading is gaming. <laughs> I actually spend a lot of my time playing video games. I think it's like what I spend the most of my free time on. I personally find it a lot easier to spend a lot of time playing a video game than reading a book. So yeah, I really like playing video games. I am a huge Legend of Zelda fan. I mostly just play Zelda and Stardew Valley and then I like random other indie games that are very vibey. Let's answer a few questions about uni because a lot of people had questions about like tips for uni, people who are starting uni soon, who are currently in uni kind of struggling, wondering like, if I have any tips or advice as someone who's already done the whole thing. I think looking back, my main tip for uni is to truly understand that you are there for yourself, you know, to, to develop yourself. Ooh. Don't get too like bugged up on like, oh, I need to only study and get good grades, but 100% take your time to do extracurricular things. So that could be like, doing random other classes just that you find interesting, even though it has nothing to do with like what you're majoring in or what you wanna do with your life later. Just do the things and learn the things that you're interested in because whatever you wanna do with the rest of your life might still change. So take this moment to just learn the things that you find interesting and also do like extracurricular activities like going to clubs or not like dance clubs. I mean, you could, but I mean like joining a club or like a student group or sports, just like anything just outside of studying. University for me was really the time where I learned to be myself and who I am and what I like to do. And it's because I spent a lot of time just doing other stuff aside from studying. Um, of course, I studied a lot, definitely. <laughs> but I also, you know, like developed my social skills, which was very much necessary. By doing all these things aside from just studying, you really learn to be your own person. You learn to be more independent. You really learn who you are. And you just also develop as a person aside from just an academic being, you know? And if it takes you a little bit longer to graduate, that is not the end of the world. Like the most important thing should be your own self-development and don't make the mistake I did in my first year and that is somehow assume that like university life is just gonna come falling out of the sky where you just suddenly have like this amazing college life. You have to make that yourself. Like you have to put in the effort, do the scary thing of like joining a student group or something to actually get like the fun social part of studying going because otherwise you really are just sitting in your room studying which is what I did the first year did not make me happy did not make me happy at all and then 
after a year I started doing extra things both socially and like academically and that is when university really became like this complete experience for me. Also, a lot of people asked how do you manage to read and follow other hobbies while also studying at university. And I think this tip is also gonna apply to anyone who's like working. Just in general, it can be difficult to like find time for your hobbies and reading. And I think my main tip is to just have kind of a routine, like just have standards spaces and times in which you enjoy reading. For example, for me, for the longest time, I would just read when I was on the train. Like if I went to university, I would read on the train. And I like to read before I go to bed. But to be completely honest with you, there were like years during my university time where I barely read anything. And that's also okay. Like you don't have to force yourself to read if you don't want to. I think the most important thing, and this is such stupid advice, but it really is planning your time right because the main reason I personally didn't really have time for like fun stuff is because I would spend a lot of time procrastinating <laughs> in which I didn't do fun stuff and I also didn't do any work I was just procrastinating and then I had to do all my work but if you turn that around and if you just plan correctly and you do all your work you have all that time that you otherwise would have used procrastinating you have the time to actually do the things that you like so genuinely just planning, getting a bullet journal, getting a diary. I do all of my planning in Google Calendar. Finding a system to really plan your day will help you see how much free time you have and then you can spend that free time reading a book. I'm putting this in a little bit later, but I also want to say that obviously if you're looking at me or like other big content creators and you look at how much they read, don't compare yourself to them. Like. Okay, I'll speak for myself. Like, it's also my job. <laughs> like, I do this for my YouTube channel. You know, I read books for you guys so I can make videos about this. So I can make time for that because it's also how I make my money. So don't compare yourself to me and how I read. You don't have to reach these standards that content creators, bookish content creators are setting who are doing this, you know, as part of like their YouTube channel. Any tips about living on your own as a uni student? So I've been living here in my little small uni accommodation, but it's not owned by the university, it's privately owned, which is why I can still live here. But it's like a student, student accommodation is what you would call it for six, oh five or six years now, a very long time. And I don't technically live on my own as I have three housemates, but it is, you know, you're moving away from your family and you have to be independent. Any tips? Do I have any tips? I think is that the main thing about living alone is that you don't have to do it alone. You know, invite friends over, get in contact with your housemates or your roommates, have dinners together. This is something that I did a lot, especially when I started studying, is you just have dinner with people for like the first few years of studying. Everyone's always finding people, looking for people to have dinner together. So I would say just finding that contact with people, you know, having little moments. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to plan like a whole date where you spend like the whole afternoon together. Just having lunch together, having dinner together, watching a movie together in the evening, just getting people over and going to other people's houses. That really helps with getting used to being in this new place. And then I think when it comes to like the more practical stuff, like learning how to cook, learning how to clean, it's a process <laughs> and that's okay. And YouTube helps. Like I've learned how to cook because I started living on my own and I didn't know how to cook. And then you just kind of trial and error. It's okay if you suck at living alone and being independent for a while. That's okay, that's why you're doing it. You're just doing it to learn. And then I wanna take some time to talk about graduation because a lot of people ask me, how do you cope with uni ending? It hasn't even hit me. I don't know what to feel. How do you navigate the feeling of being lost? How do you remove the feeling of dread? Generally speaking, a lot of people experience this extreme feeling of dread of being lost after graduating. And I definitely did too, but it's been a year, so I feel like I can 
finally start talking about it now. So just going back a little bit in case you're unaware. So I studied for seven years. I did my bachelor's in biomedical science in three years. Then I had kind of a gap year in which I followed random other classes in like psychology, philosophy, Spanish. And I was also on the board of my student association. So I would like organize activities and all that. And then after that, I spent three years doing my master's degree in Amsterdam in neurobiology. And last year, August, I graduated and it's almost a year later. And my original plan was to just have kind of a gap year. I would just spend the year focusing on doing YouTube full time, just doing the thing that I enjoy doing a lot because I've been doing it like on the side, on the weekends during university, which honestly wasn't a really great work-life balance. And I was like, let me just spend a year trying to figure out what I want. And then I also spent half of the year doing volunteering work for Milieu Defensi, which is like a climate organization in the Netherlands, which was also really fun. But the feeling of dread, let's talk about it because Oh my God, that I feel that and I still feel it. The weird thing about graduating is that, how do I even start talking about this? I think the reason that so many people experience this feeling of being lost, this feeling of dread, this feeling of being put out in the open is because you come from this very controlled achievement-based environment of university that is very high pace and suddenly you're just like, shot into the world where there is no structure. There's no structure in adult life. Your whole school career, you have been in this extremely densely packed environment that is full of milestones every few weeks of like new assignment, passing your test or failing your test. Every little roadblock is a step towards graduation. And then you finish that, you close the door behind you and you look towards adulthood and suddenly you're just in this vast empty desert that is stretching further than the eye can see on all sides and you think to yourself what do i do now what do i do now i've never been taught how to navigate without these academically imposed milestones what it felt like is that no matter which way i walked it felt like I wasn't going anywhere. But I now know it's because I was so used to when I'm walking, there would be these milestones every five meters of like, oh, you finished your assignment. Oh, you passed another test. Oh, you're gaining more points towards graduation. You're working towards graduation. Whereas as an adult, there's no one putting these little milestones for you. So when you're walking, it feels like you're going nowhere even though you're walking the same distance. Does, th <laughs> Does this allegory make any sense? So something that has really helped me is just talking to adults. <laughs> so I would have like full on adults, you know, like 50 year old plus people. Whenever I would tell them like, oh, I graduated, but I, I don't really know what to do. Like, I think I'm gonna take like a little bit of a gap year. Every single time these people would be like, oh, we you don't have to know what you want to do. Like, that's fine. Like, you don't just start somewhere. You know, you don't, what you, whatever you decide right now is definitely not gonna be what you're gonna do for the rest of your life. And then they'll talk about their own life story about how they've had so many different jobs and switched careers many times. And they're always, they always say the same thing of like, oh, you're so young, you have so much time. Whereas I'm like, I feel like I don't have time. But every adult in my life is like, you have so much time. And I think it's because when you're a university, actually it kind of already starts when you're in secondary school, you are told like, you have to make a decision now on what you want to study and it's going to decide what you want to do for the rest of your life. You have to decide right now what you want to be when you grow up. You know, it's this one choice that will define you divergent style. <laughs> And throughout university, it's like every class you take, you have to think like, does it work towards your end goal, your career goals? Every single internship you take, it's like you're working towards this career goal. 
and then you graduate and you think, well, I bet life must be this like clear road towards the end goal. And it's really not. <laughs> and suddenly every person you talk to is like, yeah, you don't have to know what you want to do. You really don't. And I'm already seeing it happening right now, you know, like if I look at all my friends who have graduated and have jobs, so many of them are doing something that kind of has nothing to do with what they studied. And that's totally okay. And it's taken me like a year to become like comfortable with the fact that it's okay to not really know where you're going. I really agree with the advice of like, oh, just because you don't know where you're going is actually a good thing because it means you can still go everywhere. Or like that Rainer Maria Rilke quote that's like, you don't have to find answers to your questions, just live the questions for now. And slowly but surely, after like a year of being graduated, I'm starting to see that this, this endless desert that post-graduation life feels like is actually more like a sandbox. And you just, you just have to play. Don't be afraid of the endless desert, just play around in the sand. And then I also got a lot of questions of people asking me about like why I chose the major I chose and what, what I'm gonna be doing right now after my little gap year, if I'm gonna do a PhD, etc. So I initially chose neurobiology, biomedical sciences because I just find it super interesting. I love learning about the systems of the body. I'm really interested in like the biology behind psychology. And I think my main interest when it comes to neurobiology was mental health and also stress. And it's something that I'm still very interested in and would hope to do something with at some point in my life. I just don't know how yet. And that's also okay. I'm just keeping that open in my mind. The question was if after like my gap year I was going to do a PhD and I've decided that it's probably not for me, at least not right now in my life. Maybe at some point later, who knows? But I know currently it's not for me. I do love researching, but there are two reasons that a PhD is not gonna be for me. The first thing is that, oh, however much I love researching, <laughs> the thing about doing a PhD is that you are going to be doing research on like one small singular topic for four years of your life. And I'm just not cut out for that. Like I'm someone who is like widely interested in so many things. Like even with studying neurobiology, I was already struggling with the fact that I was like, I'm actually interested in all these different non-biology related subjects as well. And then when you do a PhD, you focus on like one teeny tiny thing within neurobiology. And I can't do that. Like I, my interests, go all over the place and I want to do something that allows me to like switch gears a lot. And the second reason that I know PhD isn't gonna be my thing uh, is because it's really stressful and a lot of people work overtime and don't really have a lot of space for like hobbies aside from that and I know like I don't want to give up the YouTube channel. I love love making videos, I love making content, I love being creative, and if I did a PhD, I don't know if it would be possible to make videos. Because generally everything I hear about PhDs is that you're just gonna overwork yourself, and I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. I don't want that in my life. And I guess the third reason is also that I know I want to do something that also provides an outlet for my creative side. You know, I like to make things, I like to create things, do things, organize things. And that's really missing if you're doing just like pure research PhD work. So those are my reasons. I still love neurobiology and I still love researching. I just need to find a job where I can combine that with a little bit of creativity which actually beautifully brings me to my next point because a lot of people ask me, do you do something beside YouTube? Is YouTube your main job now? Like, what are you gonna do after your gap year? And YouTube is my main job. That's what I've been doing for the past year. I've been focusing on making content for you guys and I really, really like it because honestly, this is the place where I can combine like my enjoyment of doing a little deep dive in something and researching something, which is why I've been making more video essay kind of videos on the main channel. 
and also the creative side of, you know, making the video and making little drawings and designing little things for the Patreon and all that and also the creativity that goes into making vlogs so I'm kind of doing the whatever is like the perfect combination for me right now in the past year I've been making videos that I'm really proud of I finally been able to make the videos that I've been wanting to make since forever but couldn't because I didn't have enough time so I want to continue doing this for as long as possible I really love doing this I can make a living off it, it which I'm extremely grateful for I'm not sure where it's gonna take me but I do know I want to continue doing this so now that my gap year is over I just want to continue doing this and probably focus on maybe some side projects. I'm looking for side projects to work on personal projects. I don't know, I don't know what yet, but I don't know if you're a friend and you're watching this, hit me up if you have a side project. <laughs> How long have you been doing YouTube for and what inspired you to create a booktube channel? I've been doing this for eight years, yes. I started my booktube channel in 2015 because I watched a lot of booktube videos and I loved watching these videos of people talking about the books I was also reading and at some point I was just like I want to share my opinion too I love sharing my opinion so let's create a channel <laughs> I was just really inspired by all the booktube channels that I watched then I think the only booktube channel that I watched back then that is currently still going is Peru's project so big shout out to Reagan you are amazing and I love that you've been making videos for so long and you have contributed to me making a YouTube channel so thanks so in the summer of 2015 I was like let me just upload my own video giving my own opinions about books and it was just kind of like a fun thing that I did on the side I also stopped at some point for like almost two years because university was getting too busy uh, and then I came back in 2019 and I've been loving making videos ever since and I never, never, genu I know everyone says this, but I never thought that I would be able to turn it into my job and make a living out of it. But here I am still making videos and I love doing it. It just, it's my favorite creative outlet. Someone asked for my process of making a new video from inspiration to final product. Most of my videos, well, it, differs a lot some videos are shorter to make whereas more like in the videos take a lot more time but generally it takes me about three to four days to make a video and i start with brainstorming ideas i have a whole list of video ideas that i want to make and then once every month i just like sit down and plan what videos i think are going to be good enough what videos i think people are going to be interested in which videos I want to make and then every week I just start with the video I always start with like planning I love doing a lot of planning some videos only require just making like a short bullet list bullet point list of things I want to talk about whereas other videos require like actual research in-depth scripting then when I have that done I will set up the camera make sure I have like a background that looks nice that the lighting is nice out of all the things i do i think filming is spent the least amount of time on and what i then spent the most amount of time on is after i finish filming is just editing which can take anywhere from like six hours minimum to like 16 hours maximum and then i still have to make a thumbnail think about what I want to title the video make sure it's interesting to click on and all that stuff if the video is sponsored I first have to get it approved by the sponsor and then if they approve it I will throw it online usually on Sunday evening but not always a lot of people asked how do I maintain a work-life balance when I'm self-employed and I think this question is also interesting to people who are not self-employed but people who are students and trying to have like a studying life balance I'm struggling with this to be honest it's it's hard to maintain a work-life balance if you don't just have like an office that you go to and then you're done working when you get home you can always work more or you can always study more you know you can always you're always thinking about it so I'm <laughs> to be honest I'm still learning how to maintain a good 
work-life balance but the main thing is to just set like a really strong boundaries with yourself for example i don't work on the weekends which i think is a pretty like standard boundary that's good for everyone and then i also i don't work after i've had dinner so that those moments are just off limits for me unless i really need to finish something and i didn't get it done on time but generally when i plan my day when i plan my week i plan my work in such a way that i don't have to work at night and i don't have to work on the weekends and then i also make sure to just turn off like email notifications on my phone so i don't like see that when i'm not working th little things like that and a lot of you guys have more questions about like managing stress and managing overwhelm any tips on finding the little happinesses in life when you're overwhelmed with stress and work i think my main tip for this is you know how when you're just like really overwhelmed and very stressed you just want to do something fun but like it sucks that there are just these life tasks that you have to do like you still need to clean your house you still need to wash yourself you still need to feed yourself three times a day try to find joy in any of these like mandatory tasks for example i found out that i really like cooking cooking is something that really brings me joy it really calms me down it's something that i like to do when i'm stressed which is great because then i've also already cooked for myself you know and it's just like one of those mandatory tasks that i don't have to think about anymore and it's also something that de-stresses me but this could also be like maybe you really like you know having a nice bath and you know turning your normal just like shower routine into something that really brings you joy and zen just try to find one of those mandatory tasks and turn it into something that really calms you down and de-stresses you. What are your tips on overcoming burnout or feeling unmotivated? Very good question. I think those two are very different things. Like overcoming burnout is something that you can only do by not doing anything. Like if you are truly like in burnout, genuinely the only way to heal from that is to stop working to stop doing it completely um and you should probably go to a doctor by the way um so the best thing is to avoid burnout and listening to yourself and taking care of yourself and when it comes to feeling unmotivated like when you know maybe your passion has burned out a little bit what really helps for me is kind of trying to go back to why you're doing it in the first place you know whatever your job or the thing that you're studying and maybe trying to find a way to do that thing again in an environment without pressure like for example when i was feeling pretty unmotivated with studying and i really didn't know what i wanted to do for my master's degree and if i even liked what i was doing i started taking other classes in like random interesting topics that i liked that had nothing to do with my degree i just did them for fun and that reminded me of how fun it is to learn how fun it is to learn new things and that kind of reignited my love for studying uh, biomedical science and neurobiology what helps you to calm down or find peace reading of course although i will say because it's also part of my job it doesn't calm me down as much as it used to i always have like my work brain on when i'm reading so for me what calms me down lately i've really been loving just taking some time to just listen to some music and just kind of walk around the house <laughs> i've been doing puzzles <laughs> just listening to podcasts going for walks anything like that i think my biggest tip here is to really listen to yourself and understand that there's a difference between calming down and distracting yourself just going on your phone or just watching things may feel like it's calming you down but it's actually just distracting you from your stress so really focus on things that actually you feel in your body it's calming you down and that's going to be different for everyone then some personal questions i got a lot of people asking me where do you get your style inspiration from like fashion advice um is such a good question i also don't know i genuinely my style just comes from the fact that i i just spend a lot of time on pinterest and I think the main thing about my style is that I tend to buy within the same color palette. 
so that everything I own kind of goes with everything I own. Genuinely, like, one of the main reasons that an outfit will really look like a coordinated outfit is just if the colors match. So almost all of the colors, almost all of my clothes match in color. And when I find an outfit, I always try to put clothes together that fit together color-wise and then instantly it just looks like you thought about your outfit. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just thinking about how I went from really not having a style for a very long time to having a style. And of course it's gonna be different for everyone, but for me this was just the fact that at some point I just stopped being afraid of wearing what I wanted to wear and I started getting more inspiration from Pinterest and putting those two together and then also on top of that put in like many many years of acquiring, slowly acquiring clothes that I really like and now I am where I currently am. Just don't make the mistake of just randomly buying a lot of clothes uh, because a style is something that progresses and s slowly evolves over years. You can't just make up a style right now because if you do that, you're probably going to accidentally be following trends and you're not gonna be liking your style in a, in a year. So it takes time and that's fine. I think that's like the main message of everything in this video. You have time. You just have the time. The last question I very quickly want to mention, do you have any common mistaken assumptions about you? Yes. Two things, I do not live in Amsterdam. People always think I live in Amsterdam. I do not, it's way too expensive. Although I would like to live there one day. I just went to university there. I don't live there. And two, I did not study English or literature. But if you made it this far into the video, you probably already know that by now. But a lot of people assume that. I hope that any of the answers to these questions were helpful. I hope to start making a little bit more vlogs on this channel because I've been kind of ignoring this channel. Not ignoring it, I just didn't find the time to make vlogs because I put all of my time into my main channel. So I'm trying to kind of balance it a little bit more, but we'll see where it goes. I hope you are here with me to enjoy the ride. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and I will see you soon in another video very soon. Goodbye.